animal behavior and zoology and um, uh, uh, conservation. And uh, I've been at Anglia Ruskin University um, for, for quite some time. And in fact, um, back in 2001, um, uh, a student arrived um, to join my um, group of personal tutees um, called Nikki. And uh, Nikki arrived in um, uh, Freshers Week and uh, we met and um, Nikki expressed a very strong interest in cat behaviour uh, from day one, really. And um, it was uh, fairly useful for Nikki because I just completed uh, work on cat behaviour um, at University of Southampton, um, uh, which is, as uh, some of you may know, is where um, you can, I, I'm not sure if it's still running the course there, but you could do a pet behaviour counselling course. Uh, yeah, with I've the people I'd work with. Is it not running anymore? No, sadly not. Ah, OK, well, at the time um, it was running there. And um, so Nikki uh, was with us uh, for three years doing a degree in animal behaviour. Uh, I was also her um, project supervisor and um, we actually managed to do, Nikki managed to do a very good project on um, uh, cat purring. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, we, we managed to turn into a scientific project because we were looking at behavioural responses and um, uh, vocalisations in relation to different um, uh, forms of, of petting in cats. Um, uh, and we even involved uh, people from the audio music tech um, to help us with the sound in that. Um, so, yes, uh, Nikki was carrying on her interest in cats into her project. Um, and then uh, when Nikki graduated, um, went to manage a boarding cattery, and as I understand, um, uh, was was effectively in charge for about day three, um, then took some time out to go around the world and applied while doing that for a place to do uh, vet nursing. Um, and while undertaking vet nursing, also um, did the um, course in, uh, see if I can get this one right, Companion Animal Behaviour Therapy from COPE, the Centre of Applied Pet Pathology, um, and uh, worked then as a vet nurse in uh, three practices, yes. and then undertook the, uh, oh, while doing that, uh, started the Companion Animal Behaviour Therapy Counselling uh, course at Southampton, um, which incidentally I, I used to teach on some years ago. Um, and uh, before she got to the end of that course, she'd done the postgraduate diploma um, level and then was interviewed for a job at Cats Protection. Uh, so that was in 2010 um, and went to Cats Protection as a um, cat behaviour. Was 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 the title behaviour manager at that point, Nikki? It was, yes. Ah, went to Cats Protection as a behaviour manager. Um, now, the remarkable thing then was that um, uh, Nikki was the uh, sole behaviour manager for Cats Protection. And I think to put it in context, I think I've got these numbers right. We're talking about roughly 40 to 50,000 cats being homed a year, about 11,000 volunteers, about 1,000 staff. And all the queries about cats' um, behaviour ended up on, on Nikki's desk um, for about eight years and then um, got some support. Somebody came to help work with her um, after eight years and they're now looking to grow the team more. Um, and hopefully get some more um, regional behaviourists in. So fingers crossed there. Um, so one of the um, uh, amazing things about uh, Nikki's life is how um, she's wanted to do uh, cat behaviour um, since she was 16 and has um, really dedicated her life to that and is now um, uh, thought at the time that it was a good career to go in because at some point it would be um, uh, the, the care of cats would be licensed at some point. And now I understand Nikki is involved in um, working towards that licensing herself. Um, so a career in cats, um, it is uh, it is possible to do such a thing. Um, so that's my introduction uh, to Nikki, who um, uh, probably knows more than most, in fact, almost everybody, I think, about cats and their behaviour. Um, and Nikki is going to talk to us about kitten socialisation. Great. Thank you, Toby. Thank you very much for the introduction. And as first, I just want to say thank you to um, ARU um, for allowing me to speak today. I'm really, really pleased. Um, this is a lovely topic. It's one that's close to my heart and um, and certainly one that I, I'm very passionate about putting into practice what you preach. And I have personally done kitten socialisation on my own cat. So I fostered a queen and, lit and a litter of kittens um, with the view to keeping my current cat. 
and um, have, you know, because they personally socialize them and, and fully appreciate the work that is involved. Um, so like I say, it's, uh, it's not just on paper, it's um, good to get the practical experience as well. So um, I'm aware that we're going to have a mixed audience today. Um, so some of you will be cat owners, I imagine most of you will be cat owners actually. Um, some of you may be um, working with cats or volunteering with cats. Um, some of you may be students. So I shall try my best to pitch this talk um, to sort of hit all levels. OK, so first and foremost, I just want to put this talk into context, and that is that we are looking at the five welfare needs. Um, this is something that the PDSA poor report look at every single year. And um, it's worth noting that there's still many members of the public that aren't aware that about the five welfare needs, the fact that there's the Animal Welfare Act, and they do have a duty of care to, to do these, um, these five welfare needs for their cat. Um, the one we'll be concentrating, of course, on today is the need to exhibit normal behavioural patterns. And first and foremost, I just want to start off with having a little quick snapshot of looking at you know, different bits of cat behaviour and thinking about um, why the cat might be doing it and what is a problem for the cat. So um, with your top right um, photograph, you've got a cat that's hunting. Hunting is a natural behaviour. It's often misunderstood by people. Um, literally only a couple of days ago, I was interviewed on the radio for somebody thinking that cats were doing it because they were psychopaths, but actually it is a natural behaviour, it's um, innate, meaning that they're born with it. And um, even a cat that's never had access to prey in their kitten socialisation period, which we'll discuss a bit later on, can still become competent hunters, including ratters. And hunting a rat is quite a uh, formid formidable prey. So yes, but it's, like I say, very um, misunderstood. Equally so is scratching the sofa. Um, scratching in general is a natural behaviour. Cats need to exhibit this natural behaviour, but again, often misunderstood by people and owners that find it extremely frustrating. I have heard people saying they feel that the cat's getting revenge on them for something they did last week, which, like I say, whilst is a common misconception, is uh, sadly not true. Um, actually, thankfully not true. But, um, and indeed, what the cat needs is an appropriate scratching post. But, so yeah, not feeling uh, revenge, that's for sure. Hiding on your top left is natural behaviour again. However, it should only be done in short bouts. If, it, if the cat's sort of hiding all the time, um, then it may indicate that there's a medical problem or an ongoing behavioural problem. So it's something to be mindful of. The cat should always be given a hiding place to have the ability to express this natural behaviour. Um, and of course, the bottom left, which is a cat showing aggressive behaviour. This one I'd probably say is the most misunderstood of them all because they're often labelled as evil devil cats, again, without appreciating the underlying emotional state of this cat um, and the possible underlying causes, which again could be medical, behavioural or both. So certainly from a cat perspective of which is a problem for the cat, I'd say potentially the cat that's hiding and the aggressive cat as well. So like I said, that was just a brief introduction to some of the cat behaviours there are. There's obviously plenty. Um, but we're going to be focusing on kittens, so we want to talk about what shapes a cat's behaviour. Um, this was actually something that was discussed at university with a classic nature and nurture debate. Um, and of course, we know that it's both. Um, and there's a complex interplay between these two um, factors. And so just for example, um, with uh, hunting behaviour, for example, as I mentioned earlier, they have got this innate ability to hunt. So that's the sort of the nature side of it. But then on the nurture side, the queen bringing back um, semi-dead prey back to the litter presents an opportunity for the kittens. So she's not necessarily actively teaching the kittens how to hunt, but she's presenting them with um, semi-dead prey to um, get their instincts going and, and give them the opportunity to practice their hunting ability. But that will shape their hunting preferences. So that then brings in the nurture side of things. So you can see alone from just one behaviour how this can how they can be affected. But in general, um, oh, by the way, I should say that um, I always use a lot of my own pictures in this. So this this photo here shows um, some of the kittens in the litter. The black cat, um, he's not in this photo, but is my cat. And he regularly features in online for uh, Cats Protection YouTube. Anyway, um, factors that affect an individual cat's behaviour. Um, so catathology, so looking at the cat's normal behaviour in the natural environment. And for domesticated species, we often look at the um, ancestral species as well. So in this case, the African wildcat, particularly because they haven't really changed that much um, genetically or behaviourally um, over time. 
We want to look at genetic effects um, in cats. They're looking at their personality. So for example, the trait for boldness coming from the father, some work done by Sandra McCune. Um, learning occurs uh, particularly in the first you know, um, part of life, known as the kitten socialization period, but of course it does occur throughout the whole of life. And that's always worth bearing in mind. Cats will be affected by medical conditions. So for example, um, a cat that has a really bad headache, yes, cats do get headaches, um, will definitely lower their threshold for being able to cope and therefore they may be more likely to show aggression, for example. Um, previous, previous learning experiences can play a role as to, and shape how they feel about something. Um, this very much comes into play with social behaviour, for example. And of course, the current environments and cats, particularly compared to other species, are really, really affected by their environment. This is why we're often talking about resources, and I certainly will be talking about resources in this talk as well. It's definitely one of the ways in which you can make a big difference to your cat's life and well-being. Um, so yes, before the kitten's even born, there's factors going into play that can affect um, how the kittens grow up. I mentioned it briefly, but just to sort of discuss this uh, Sandra McCune work a little bit more. So she looked at um, different litters of kittens, and they had um, and they looked at which fathers were involved. So they had friendly fathers and fearful fathers, or you know, friendly, more bold, outgoing, etc. Fathers. And given that the father cats were not involved in the um, rear of the offspring at all, literally just from a genetic perspective, um, they then studied how the kittens um, behave later on. And certainly the kittens from the friendlier fathers tend to be friendlier and sort of more bold and outgoing compared to the fearful fathers, which tended to produce the more fearful kittens. So it is very interesting um, and one that not many people know. Um, I know that definitely some people in here listening today definitely do know that <laughs> because they recognise some of the names. Um, and also bear in mind that um, one litter of kittens can all have different fathers as well. Um, I'm pretty sure, Toby, this might have been one of your studies. If not, it's something, something you mentioned, I think, in class. Um, but um, they can have as many different fathers, by the way, as there are kittens as well. But yeah, like I said, there was a study that comes to mind from Southampton where there was paternity testing in kittens. And um, correct me if I'm wrong, but from memory, um, there was one particular household that had an entire queen and an entire tom. And it turned out that he fathered none of those kittens and it was actually a feral cat coming in and fathering both her kittens and quite a few in the study, which is a very interesting work. So when do we talk about socialisation? It's definitely one of those words that gets banded around quite a lot and easily confused. Um, so particularly in the rescue environment, for example, people may talk about socialising with cats um, and what they mean is sort of spending quality time with or hanging out with. Whereas when I discuss socialisation, and indeed in the literature, we're very much discussing the time when the kitten's are very young. So it's a socialisation period, which is two to seven weeks. Um, so this is a study done by Karsh and Turner, um, looking at um, when this sort of very critical or sensitive type period was. And this is very much um, a window when they're really taking in loads of information about what is normal in their world. Uh, typically happens in the core territory, the nest in the sort of nearby vicinity. Um, and it really does help to sort of teach them about the world, what's going to be normal for them and help to increase their adaptability, which again we'll look at in a bit. It's also a period when the brain is going through some huge, huge changes, um, uh, including the sensory system as well. And um, I do love there's actually a Rachel Casey analogy that she uses that I often pinch, um, which is that you have to imagine that you're mayor of a new town and you're putting in roads all over the place. And you have to imagine that the roads that get used the most are the ones that will persist, whereas the roads that you put in at the beginning that then weren't that useful, they will often die off. Um, and this is what's sort of happening in the brain when we are introducing experiences to kittens in the socialisation period. You're sort of forming those new nerve pathways. And then each time we repeat these experiences, these positive experiences while strengthening that nerve pathway. So you're really affecting the, the brain development and how this persists for the rest of the cat's life. And this is why um, this particular point, I can't stress enough how important this period is for really setting the cat up for life. Um, it is resource intensive. It does take a lot of work, as I said before, you know, I've done it and it's it does take a lot of work. But the difference that people can make that are actively engaging in kitten socialisation um, on those individuals makes a huge difference to their welfare for the rest of their life, particularly thinking about 
interacting with a litter of kittens, you could also be affecting, say, four, five, six individuals at once as well. So the implications are huge. Um, for any kittens, it's about um, that are being socialised. It's about preparing them for the normal domestic life and being a pet. Um, this is happening all over the place, whether it's from um, breeders or rescue organisations uh, or people that have had an accidental litter. Um, particularly for those of us that are in rescue um, and the cats are in, in a pen environment, so like a sort of in, uh, cat accommodation that's confined, um, which may be in somebody's back um, in their home or in a foster room or in a centre. Um, it's a very different sort of environment to being in a home. And this is why it's even more critical in these circumstances to really prepare the kittens for life later on. So socialisation in practice, what do we need to do? Um, as you can see for one of our vet students here, it is a lot of fun. You can see from the smile. Um, but we need to give them lots of different sorts of stimulation from this early age. And the most important thing is that it needs to be positive experiences. If these happen to be negative, then you'll only be causing the cats or these kittens to become sensitised and more fearful of particular situations. So I think this is more common perhaps on the puppy side, where I think that um, people get their charts and because it's more common, people are more aware of puppy socialisation on the charts and want to literally tick everything off all the time. Um, and it can be very overwhelming for puppies. Um, whereas it just needs to be structured and careful um, and gradually introducing different experiences in a positive way and then repeating them over the over the period. We say um, handling experiences should um, begin from the age of two weeks and that ties in nicely with the um, opening of their ears and eyes. Um, in practice they have done it earlier but you do need to make sure that you've, well, you always need to make sure that you've got the Queen is on board and so getting her um, you know making sure that you're friendly with her and that she's comfortable if you being around her kittens and stroking them is very much important but yeah certainly from two weeks that's particularly important to start then um just a few little terms so habituation is just a term meaning that we're getting kittens used to different sorts of stimuli so different objects and things and in, in their environment um sound sights etc and making sure they quickly learn that it's just nothing to be concerned about so it's something they can kind of take in and then and then discard and so that later on it you know when you think about the fact that the brain has so much information coming in at any one time habituation is great for not being overwhelmed because you've already learned that's yes you know what that is and it clocks it almost subconsciously flooding um contrary to the recent um you know storms we've had um in a behavioral sense is repeat exposure to something the cat finds extremely distressing and usually without the opportunity to express their natural coping mechanisms such as being able to escape or hide um, and this is extremely um, detrimental to them and severely compromises welfare and needs to be avoided the difficulty with flooding is that many people that are doing it have absolutely no idea that they are flooding and it's intended to be accidental so this is more common on um, with feral cats for example if anybody was to say uh, bring a feral cat into somebody's home or a rescue and try to turn them into a pet cat, um, which is, you know, socialisation is not going to work on an adult feral cat. Um, they would find that extremely distressing. And if this was over a length, prolonged length of time, this would be considered flooding. So which brings me on to feral kittens then. Um, feral kittens are kittens that have had little or no experience of people. Um, I always find it interesting when people talk about um, cats reverting back to the wild, whereas I have my own theory is that actually they all start off like that. And actually by actively engaging with socialization, then it's that that we're helping to bring them into, you know, socializing towards people and and pet cats, because I get asked how many generations it takes to, to you know, create the feral cat. And it's one. You just need one litter of kittens to be born outside and not have any experience or extremely limited experience with people. And if they're eight weeks or over, then they're going to be feral kittens and, and fearful of people. Um, so this is why um, certainly at Cats Protection, our policy is to trap, neuter and return feral cats um, wherever possible. Within the kitten socialization period, if the kittens are young enough and there's uh, appropriate resources, et cetera, then we may well socialize feral kittens if they're, if they're young enough. Um, like I said, anything over eight weeks, then, then we will be trapped neutering and returning them. 
Um, apologies if this doesn't come out on your screen very well, but you don't need to necessarily read it. I will read various bits out to you. But it's just to give you an idea of here's an example of a kitten socialization chart. This was developed by Dr. Rachel Casey. Um, and then she did some research alongside Dr. John Bradshaw. Um, and these were done on cats protection kittens. So we had litters of kittens that received this chart and the socialization is coming with it versus kittens that had a bit of ad hoc handling as and when they were cleaned out. Then the kittens were followed up and when they were a year old, um, this was discussed with the owner how they were. And what was really interesting is, well, as you wouldn't be surprised, the kittens that had a structured program like this were not only showing less uh, fear responses, um, but they were also more emotionally bonded to their owners and vice versa. And certainly the owners felt more emotional support from their cats, which I thought was rather lovely. And from that, I like to extrapolate that if they're more emotionally bonded to their cats, they're probably less likely to try and return them to rescue um, later in life. So really important research. And we're very grateful to Rachel for this, this chart, which we still use today. So just a few areas to point out. Basically, with kitten socialization, you just need to hit all the different senses in a nice, gradual, positive way. Um, obviously, there's quite a focus on handling and getting them used to different um, ways of being held. And um, some of the items that are listed here will encompass um, a health check, which is very useful for when they're in vet practice later on. Um, uh, walking on different sorts of surfaces. So, for example, we've got here like, you know, line, liner or tiles, carpet, um, shiny surface, etc. Um, meeting different handlers, which I'll discuss in a bit. Um, different sounds. Cats Protection now has its um, own sound socialization CD um, and free sounds downloads online. But the links coming up later. Um, they need to get used to different litter tray preferences. Um, this is really key because we have actually found that if you are if you do have a litter of kittens that have only been used to one type of litter, then um, it can cause toileting problems. Um, not even later in life, but actually after rehoming, quite soon after rehoming, we've had problems. And then when we reverted back to having at least two different litter types during that socialization period then the kittens are much more adaptable later in life. So it's really useful, particularly if owners were to, say, switch the litter, which are commonly done quite quickly, even that needs to be ideally done gradually. Um, and it's allowing that kitten to think, OK, well, this is what I was expecting, but um, I can work with this and to be adaptable. So, yes, different litter types, very important. Um, and then we've got scratching facilities, different flavours of food, different scents. Um, so we do use, for example, cloths of a healthy, friendly vaccinated dog, cat, rabbit, baby. Depends what, you know, is available to us, but um, it can make a huge, huge difference. A variety of different toys to engage in those different play styles. Um, other activities um, and um, yeah, potentially contact with um, visual contact with others as well. Uh, as mentioned before, like I say, we've got our own um, kitten socialization section of the website, so please do have a look at that. As I mentioned before, we've got our free kitten um, sounds downloads as well as more information and videos and things in this section. Um, with the sounds, just to mention, we have got um, all sorts of sounds on there that do sound a little bit unusual if you don't know what we were thinking when we put this together. <laughs> so, for example, there is um, artillery in there, which I fully appreciate sounds a bit full on to have um, sort of gunshot noises, etc. and why a cat would need to get used to that. One thing to note about sounds in particular is that they can generalise. So um, a cat that's certainly been used to artillery noises during its kitten socialisation period will not really um, be too phased if later on in life somebody drops a, a pan in the kitchen it makes a big banging noise. Of course they will have a startle response and that is natural but the key thing here is that they will recover quickly they're not going to spend the next three days hide underneath the bed and that's what we're looking for with these kittens. Um, and then a few things I've added into our sounds that we is different to what the um, we had a different supplier of uh, sounds previously before making our own one is um, I've actually introduced coughing which <laughs> we we did this a while ago and now this fits in quite perfectly for the pandemic simply because the CD that uh, I use a different um, organization CD for my own cat coughing wasn't on there and he really doesn't like coughing and so uh, I put some of the more human sounds in like coughing and sneezing um, onto our sounds to get kittens used to it but yes it's got everything from children playing babies crying about eight different doorbells fireworks which is a classic 
uh, vacuum cleaner noises, etc. So, um, and I'm happy to report that with my own cat, he's not faced by fireworks. So you can see again, already the huge welfare benefits of doing this. Um, with the CDs, you want to be playing them or the sounds um, at least once a day and, and making sure the kittens are curious and not fearful of the sounds. So maybe they're playing them quietly to start with and building up. Um, again, hopefully the queen's not, not too phased either because they will be getting learnt behaviours from the queen. Um, so yeah, building it into routines. I said it's resource intensive, it is. And so particularly for those working or volunteering with cats who are extremely busy people, um, it's about how else can you build it into those already busy routines. So for example, if you have to go and weigh the kittens, then um, you could put them in a, carrying, a cat carrier and transport them to the weighing scales. You can touch their toes and touch their ears um, very briefly whilst doing it and then before returning them back to their pen. You can see in the background an example of a, of a pen there. So I mentioned before that um, getting kittens used to a variety of people is really key. Um, four is the magic number, so that's um, some research that's been done to show that um, ideally kittens need to get used to at least four different sorts of people. So not even four lovely ladies or gentlemen, but um, a man, woman, um, an older person, a vet, a child, um, someone, as you can see here, in like full hazmat type suit, PPE. Um, just because we obviously come in all shapes, forms and sizes, etc. And um, the cats won't necessarily generalise that unless they've been used to it as young kittens. So it's really, really important. This is where you get to rope friends and family in as well. Um, I mentioned about the um, the centre of the cloth. Um, I used to do a lot of kitten socialisation at actually the centre that we had on site as well. Um, so I did that my lunch breaks. And um, these are some of the kittens I've worked with. And this ginger kitten here, we one of our, um, we used, funny enough at Cats Protection, we have a office dog policy, which I think surprises most people. So you can have a dog in the office. And we had a, a mastiff at the time. He was very lovely and friendly. And so I rubbed this yellow cloth on 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 Ruby the Mastiff and um, then put it in a Ziploc bag over to the adoption centre and then this is the response that you see from the kitten. So very curious, interested, coming over, having a sniff. And then I did find out from the staff there that, because um, we've been doing this regularly, that the kittens, even though they'd never met a dog, if they were rehomed um, where there was a resident dog, and bear in mind we will be doing a gradual introduction programme to the between the kitten and the dogs, so they're not just put together. Um, the kittens did respond much more positively once we'd introduced these scented cloths of um, healthy, friendly, vaccinated dogs. So, um, yes, yeah, just nice to share a few examples. Um, yes, different talks of litter. I've mentioned about the litter types already. Um, there are obviously differences in practices because there'll be variation amongst different rescues and also with um, breeders as well. So. Um, Many, in the rescue environment, they're generally going home after the first vaccination, so they may be sort of about nine weeks old, eight or nine weeks. Whereas um, the GCCF, so the Governing uh, Council of Cat Fancy, which is like your cat kennel club, advocates home and kittens after their second vaccination at 13 weeks. So it will depend, the, the environment in which the kittens are in, as well as all the other circumstances, will play a big part in um, the variation in practices. and how long they should be kept with mum, for example, versus weighing up the disease risks. But certainly in the rescue environment, we have a whole variety of different pens. So I mentioned earlier, we've, you can see here on the bottom left, we've got a, a lovely example of um, a fosterer room, um, which is probably the best place to have the kittens so because that's much more simulating the natural home environment. And in the middle here, you can see a, an example of a, a cat pen in the centre. So the bit you can see out there is the sort of inside cabin bit. And then there's a cat flap that goes through down to a ladder to an outside run section. And then on the far right we here, we've got um, an example of a cat pen in somebody's garden, in like a foster garden. Um, can't talk about kitten socialisation without discussing um, the infectious disease control side of things. I think the world has learned a lot in you know, the last 18 months about infectious disease. Um, but we've been being very careful with PPE for many, many years now because we're aware of how quickly it can spread and the devastating effect that it can have, particularly on kittens that have got such a, a naive or um, undeveloped immune system. So uh, it's absolutely key. Um, it's really difficult with cats because they come from a solitary ancestor. They really do hide signs of stress, pain and disease. 
Um, and therefore, it's really, really hard to tell. And sometimes a kitten that can look perfectly healthy on the outside, agree, admittedly, these ones do not look healthy. These have got cat flu. But they can still be infected and carrying disease, um, which is why we don't mix litters of kittens from different sources, because they can infect the others, often with devastating consequences. So prevention is always you know, better than cure. And that's why we're very careful with PPE and not cross-contaminating between litters. I um, just want to talk briefly about play. So object play is really, really important in kittens. Um, a game of mouse is one of the earliest games to come in. So they come in at different times. Um, and this is why it's important to get kittens used to a variety of different styles of play. So whether it's across the floor or up in the air, uh, or even with a game of rabbit, particularly if they haven't got any litter mates, if they're a lone hander, for example, giving them like a soft toy and wiggling it about to sort of, you know, uh, replicate a litter mate, that they can practice the sort of bunny kicking and kill bite um, on that toy. And there's lots of ways you can do introducing enrichment. I've certainly found that kittens are really good and very quick at taking to feed enrichment, I'd say more so than, than adult cats and certainly the elderly cats. Although I would recommend feeding enrichment for all ages, it just needs to be modified for their ability. Um, so feeding enrichment simply means giving cats food in a way that's more interesting and stimulating than a bowl. Um, that's my hand there. That's <laughs> some of the fun things I get to do with actual cats. Um, toilet roll pyramids I'm a big fan of. They're, you know, a lot of the stuff you hear, you can see well, certainly the top two are free. So um, you just sell a table, the toilet rolls together and then you put some biscuits um, from their daily allowance inside. Um, and then you need to show the cats how to use it. This is really key. And you also need to do it for a couple of minutes. I did make the mistake when I was new at Cats Protection of telling somebody to bat the puzzle ball, which is this one here and one here on the bottom left, um, bat it around and then the cat will follow you and eat the biscuits and fail to mention to do it for a couple of minutes. And the person rang me up and said, Nikki, I did what you said and I've been on my hands and knees. And I've been batting this ball around, bowl around for two hours now and the cat just doesn't understand. She just follows me and eats the biscuits. And I thought, ah, yes, I realise what I've done wrong. And um, I had to explain, yes, the cat does know what it's doing. It's just getting the owner to do all the hard work. So yes, a couple of minutes, stand back, let the cat have a go, and then demonstrate again if he needs to be. So sorry, this is jumpy on your screens, but I um, just want to demonstrate um, this is an extremely common thing for people to do with kittens. I get it, kittens are cute. When they're this age, it doesn't really hurt. But of course, as they grow up, those um, needle sharp teeth and claws get much more painful. And unfortunately, this is actually teaching kittens that hands are toys, which they most certainly are not. Um, this and ends up being inappropriate or misdirected play behavior later in life. And I have a, a huge amount of my caseload is um, adult cats showing this behavior, particularly where they do ambushing. So they, um, they sort of hide at the top of the stairs behind something and then they launch out at somebody's ankles and it appears like it's completely out of nowhere and is obviously very painful, but without people realizing or recognizing that this is simply a play behavior. It's like, so they just, they add in these extra behaviors as they get older. And unfortunately, like I say, most people, if not all of us, we've all been there, we've all done it at some point in our lives. Um, but the trick is to now know that this is not how we introduce kit play with kittens and we need to direct them onto something that is actually appropriate toys to prevent this sort of later in the life. Oh, I love the expression on this queen's face. Um, <laughs> at some point, they do get a bit fed up with their kittens. Uh, they've had enough and, um, and it's really useful during the uh, weaning process that the kittens are starting to learn to deal with frustration. So the mother will often remove herself away um, and she will remove access to the teats um, sort of gradually over the weaning process. She'll even sometimes lie down on her tummy to prevent access. So, um, and it's like I said, it's an, it's an important um, emotional lesson, if you like, for kittens. And certainly one that we do see issues with lone hand rears. Um, and uh, if, they're, if they're not learning to deal with frustration. So an important lesson. Other important lessons from mum and other litter mates is learning to deal with um, bite inhibition. So this is learning how hard or not to bite. Um, and often in these situations that, you know, the other kittens or the mother will um, certainly tell the kitten when they've had enough and that was too hard and then remove themselves from play so that play ends. Um, and so, yeah, all sorts of important lessons that they are learning from mum. I'd mentioned earlier about the you know, hunting behaviour if they're out in the wild as well. 
um, and that they, she prevents these opportunities for them to learn about prey. But yes, all in all, learning how to be a cat, very important things. But yes, the importance of good socialisation. So I've mentioned some of them already. Um, I've briefly touched on about the vets, but I just want to lay that point a little bit more now, that it really does make a huge difference towards how they feel about cat baskets, um, how they feel about being at the vet practice, for example, how they cope with being um, restrained and examined, which is quite an alien experience for them. Um, I have to admit, the very first um, vaccination when my cat was about a year old, um, that I had, I was nervous because the vets do know that I'm a behaviourist and I'm a veterinary nurse. And um, and then you are socialised my cat myself. <laughs> and so this was kind of like crunch time as to how it was all going to actually play out in real life. And uh, I was very happy to report that he lay down quite relaxed on the cat scales and they were suitably pleased and impressed. And I was extremely relieved. So, yes, he's still great now and he's still quite happy on the cat scales, which is which is great. But um Certainly, even just getting a cat into a, the bar, uh, into a cat carrier is a huge barrier for owners taking cats to the cat uh, to the vets. Understandably so, it is extremely stressful when the cats don't like it um, for both owners and the cats. I completely get it. So if we can in, get kittens used to cat baskets and think that they're fun and a safe place to be, this will make a huge difference to cat welfare because they're more likely to be taken to the vets. Condition medical conditions are likely might be picked up earlier and therefore potentially treated sooner. Uh, this is, again, I told you I put my kittens in. So um, this little black kitten is my cat, Kato. And this is just an example, as you can see, of um, them getting used to the cat carrier. Always seeing it as a bit of a game to start with. Um, they have a nice comfy blanket inside and scent continuity is really important. So making sure it smells familiar of the cats. And this is the same for not just kittens, but cats throughout their lives. Always making sure that there's a blanket in there that smells of them so it's familiar. So yes, we want to get um, everybody who's involved with young kittens used to getting them um, checked. And even once you, if you happen to be an owner who's recently rehomed a, a young kitten, continuing doing these gentle restraints and health checks at home as well is really useful. Um, not only from a kind of the kitten being used to it perspective, but again, so you can pick up on any any issues with that kitten. Um, we do advocate obviously um, minimal restraints and cat friendly handling. Um, as well as kitten friendly waiting rooms and there's a lot more information on International Cat Care's website um, with their cat friendly um, clinic scheme. I want to just briefly touch on anthropomorphism um, because this is a very long lengthy word uh, which was introduced to me at university and um, it is a double-edged sword because it has both its uses and at times definitely not useful. And here's a few examples where it's not useful. It's, the internet is full of cat anthropomorphism. Um, and unfortunately, as much as it's meant to be funny, et cetera, it's actually detracting from understanding what the cats really mean and what they feel, and ultimately be able to address the underlying behavior and, and what's going on. Um, so yes, I do feel quite strongly about the, the, um, the bad use of anthropomorphism. In a good way, it can be used to um, identify and have empathy with a cat. So, you know, whether you're, um, I don't know, you're sort of saying, doing a poster, for example, about a cat and how they might really be feeling, even if you're doing it in like the sort of first person voice of the cat. Um, very important compared to this. So yes, we want to avoid this because this is not helpful because we need to understand how the cats really feel. They are emotional animals. They just don't have the full range of emotions that people have. Um, and they, that can cause a lot of confusion so we need to appreciate them as cats as a species um, to recognize that they feel anxiety, fear, frustration. Frustration is hugely under-recognized in cats um, and a really difficult emotion to deal with. Um, I'd say from the cat's perspective, but also from ours as well. Cats can feel depressed, um, which is akin to clinical depression. Um, they can feel joy, happiness, however you wish to phrase it, relief. They can also feel an emotional response to pain. Um, I mean, they recently, no, not that recently actually, but then studies to show that fish show an emotional response to pain, as in the kind of, ow, that really hurts, rather than just a reflex of like removing themselves from, from danger. So of course, cats can definitely feel an emotional response to pain. Um, I did mention about resources. Um, it's the, the, like I say, one of the main things you can do to improve a cat's life is making sure they've got everything that they absolutely need. 
So we always recommend one resource per cat plus one extra to try and avoid any conflict or competition. For example, cats are not known for sharing. And even when they do, it's not always um, the, like there's, there's no less logic with it. So, yeah, we need to make sure we've got a bit of everything. That's just a starter list. There's, there's plenty that could be done. But then also the other key about it is not just having the right resources, but where to place them. So this in itself could be a whole lecture um, and we've only got a few minutes. But I just wanted to point out that um, many people will put a litter tray, for example, next to patio doors and cat flaps. But these are hugely overlooked areas. Um, people say the cat wants to loo with a view or they're too lazy to go into the house further to use a litter tray. Unfortunately, these are misconceptions. The cats, they they really do like privacy, just like people. So we need to have those um, litter trays much further into the house, somewhere private. Um, another key one to discuss quickly is cats need to have their food bowls away from their water bowls. This goes back to African wild cat behaviour and how they don't want to contaminate their water source with the gut contents of their prey. So it's for hygiene reasons. Whereas obviously we tend to eat and drink at the same time and we think our cats do too. So. If nothing else, go home and move your food bowl away from your cat's water bowl. If you're wondering how much, because many people ask, as far as you can. If you're in a one bed flat, just a few feet or a couple of metres. If you've got more space, different rooms will be great. So just to start summing up then, um, how can you help cats? There's so many ways. <laughs> Please volunteer, as I know some of you already do, at um, your local animal welfare charity, Cats Protection, or, or is um, welcoming new volunteers. And there's a variety of different roles available, both cat facing and non cat facing. Um, ensure any kittens that are in your care are well socialised, or if you have any friends and family that are getting a kitten, ensure that they understand about kitten socialisation. Ask those questions of a breeder or a charity. You know, if the kittens are socialised and what um, efforts were made. Um, advertise and support um, everybody, anybody and everybody with kitten socialisation. So you can spread the word and also consider getting um, your kitten from it. I'm going to say cats protection because why not? Let's be biased. We've got plenty of resources. We work very hard on them. Um, so we have the behaviour guide, which I've recently updated uh, this year, which is available online. Um, as, which is part of the cat behaviour website. We have a whole range of different leaflets, including behaviour ones. Um, there's plenty of uh, videos that we've done on YouTube, on the Cat Protection website, uh, on YouTube channel, um, discussing all sorts. We've got a whole series just on kittens. Um, so if you haven't had enough kitten pictures, get your kitten fixer videos there. Um, if you're listening thinking, oh, my cat might have a behavioural problem, what am I going to do? The first thing you need to do is get a vet check to rule out medical problems and then you need to refer, uh, get a vet referral, sorry, to a qualified behaviourist, which will be from the Animal Behaviour and Training Council. This is your one-stop shop for behaviourists and trainers. So if you happen to know somebody who needs a dog trainer or a horse behaviourist or somebody to train a reptile, there's somebody out there for everybody. And Finally, but not last, I just want to briefly mention the Cat Behaviour Conference that I've organised earlier this year. Um, that's the date that it happened to be um, aired for, for real, but it is recorded and the recordings are still available until the 24th of this month. Um, so yes, Christmas Eve. Um, so don't have Christmas without it, basically. Um, if you're a student listening, we do have a 50% off discount, um, which I will give to um, Toby and Miriam. If you're Cats Protection listening, um, it is for free for you guys. So um, I have the link. You've got my email address. Just email us um, in behaviour and we'll give it to you. Um, and then the recordings are available to watch up until the 24th of March next year. But you do need to register before Christmas Eve. And thank you very much for listening. Um, really appreciate your time. And we shall go over to questions now. Thanks very, Thanks very much, Vicky. Um, great stuff.